Welcome to Casting Class, the engineer's podcast for all things metal casting. Casting Class is brought to you by Batesville Products, the manufacturing experts who have been casting, machining, and polishing custom aluminum components for over 75 years. Today I'm joined by Rachel Weber and Stephanie Randolph to talk pros, cons of sand casting versus permanent mold casting. So Rachel and Stephanie, let's start with differences in the actual manufacturing process and then kind of go into how these differences impact the final casting. So the obvious first difference is in the name. Uh, sand casting uses sand molds while permanent mold casting uses a well permanent mold. And because of this mold difference, there are other differences during the pouring process and the production process. So Rachel, step by step, can you kind of explain how does permanent mold work and then how does sand casting work? Sure, I'll start with permanent mold. Uh, so tooling is reusable steel. Um, so these molds are mounted into a tilt pour press that the mold can tilt back and forth. You preheat and coat the molds prior to production. Uh, also use four cups that you will use to have the metal flow into the gating. Um, then the machine controls the flow. So less metal uh, turbulence happens in this process. Um, so after it tilts back, you let it solidify. And then you tilt it back into its neutral position where you eject the part and then you continue the same process over. As for sand, there are a couple of different types of sand casting. There's green sand, which is the most common and oldest, uh, no bake, core box, shell, etc. But the essential process is pattern, ram molds, operators pour directly into the gates and risers, the part solidifies, they break the mold, uh, the part is ejected out of that broken mold. Then use the pattern to ram up the next mold and restart the cycle. So essentially permanent mold you keep reusing, but the sand mold, you need a new mold for each part that you pour. So how does this affect the cost, the efficiency, or even the life cycle of the product line? Yeah, I can speak to that, Mary. Um, the cost of the tooling could be higher at early onset of the project due to its longevity. So the tooling for permanent mold we can use over and over again. Um, so it's not a once and done like the sand cores, for instance. Uh, you're, you would have a definitely a, um, could have tens of thousands of parts coming out of a permanent mold. Um, and with that, you would obviously have a higher volume product. Um, so those volumes um, tend to be more efficient for moderate to high production values in using the permanent mold process. So, Essentially what the mold's made of kind of plays a part in the costs and volumes. Like you said, Stephanie, sand is a cheaper material but used for the lower volumes because, like you said, it's not durable. But another thing is that mold material also affects the finish of the part. So can you talk a little bit about tolerances and surface finish, all of the other differences you'd expect out of the final casting of each, each process? Sure. Um, for the sand RMS, we find that we're about 300 to 560, whereas permanent mold, the RMS is about 200 to 420. At BPI, we're typically um, holding a baseline of about 300 RMS, and obviously that reduces the risk of porosity and inclusions, um, and those porosity inclusions are usually caught at um, our secondary operations, which is machining or shot blast or polishing. Um, and then. The tolerancing side of things, we're definitely tighter in the permanent mold world. Um, our linear tolerance is usually about plus or minus uh, 15 thousandths for the first inch, and then sand is double that at 30 thousandths. Uh, for the concentricity side of things, um, permanent mold starts at about 25 thousandths uh, for a diameter up to five inches, and then sand is double that, about um, 50 thou. Uh, shrinkage in the sand castings, uh, they solidify a little slower than permanent mold castings and then making them more susceptible to shrinking defects. Yeah, so Stephanie, you pointed this out, but I just want to reiterate, these are as cast tolerances that you see during the casting process, but you can use the secondary operations like heat treat, machining, and polishing to improve those features. But um, you talked about revealing or opening up those porosity and inclusion defects during 
machining or polishing. With uh, sand castings, you have more of that risk of opening up the porosity when you go below the surface, whether you're machining or polishing. And then another thing to note with secondary operations, sand castings also often need to be heat treated before machining because of the type of aluminum that you use in sand casting. So you may use secondary operations with both sand and permanent mold castings. It's common to have machining or polishing after. It's just kind of a matter of how in-depth those operations will be. So depending on your requirements, permanent mold might get you closer to that final part right out of the mold, but sand casting might need a little bit more help. That's correct. Yeah. And that's also good to be mindful if you are getting defects after machining, it could be a warning sign of your casting method, not necessarily the machining process. So given these differences in sand casting and permanent mold castings, Rachel, when do you typically see one process used over the other? Um, first would be the volume. So typically, if you have a particular volume of production you are looking to get out of uh, these parts, you're going to tend to lean towards one process or the other. So typically, sand is low to moderate volume and permanent mold is moderate to high volume, granted. Everyone kind of has their different definitions of what moderate volume is. So we say usually a few thousand pieces a year is where permanent mold is, and sand casting is a couple hundred pieces a year. Um, sand is also really good for prototyping. So if you're, if you're looking to start a new project that's not been tested and verified, that's a good process to start with. And then if you get into higher production, potentially switching to permanent mold would be a good opportunity. Um, also, size of the casting. So you're gonna be a little more limited on your size of the casting with permanent mold. Uh, typically, anywhere from one pound up to 100 pounds is where we say in terms of mass, but it's also the footprint of the part. Um, sand casting is really unlimited on size. They, you can get up to a couple hundred pounds for a casting, so it's really good for those niche, higher mm -hmm. size parts. And that size is because of the tilt pour press that you're using in permanent mold casting. Correct. So you can't have a part that's too heavy or a mold that you can't mount onto the press. You, you're kind of limited there. Correct. And there are standalone molds or static pour, but when you start getting, if you need like a nicer surface finish, but you can go get away with a static pour, you can do that in permanent mold, but most foundries would recommend doing tilt pour. One other thing to consider is also uh, the, which we've already talked about, is the tolerances needed and or the density of the casting. So if you're looking for tighter tolerances, permanent mold will tend to be a little better because you've got that reduced parting line need. So I think Stephanie said it earlier, it's 15,000 for permanent and 30,000 for sand. Um, additionally, you get a lot denser castings with permanent mold due to the type of tilt process used. So it's, been, it's kind of popular in a lot of medical and food industries to use our process. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about uh, volume and along with that requirement of the density and the tight tolerances, we had a food production equipment part that came through and the reason that they they were originally doing sand casting, but the main reason that they switched to permanent mold was sand casting just couldn't keep up with the volumes that they had run into. So kind of as your product line evolves, you can switch from casting to permanent mold. Yes, it's probably one of the easier switches to do. Every part is custom. You know, you really have to take into account your specific requirements, the EAU like you were talking about, uh, and really decide what's important to your part when you're deciding which process to use. Yeah. Any final thoughts, Stephanie or Rachel? Uh, we can do semi-permanent mold, which is a combination of both of those things. I think Rachel, we recently onboarded um, several customers that require a, a semi-permanent mold. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So what's uh, unique about semi-permanent mold is a lot of people think you can only use sand core and sand casting but actually you can use a sand core and a permanent mold casting as well it cores out the middle of the part you have some sort of 
locating pins to help keep the core in place. You close the mold around it and then you cast the metal into the mold and it will solidify around it so you get the nice permanent mold outside finish and then you can also get those internal geometries you need. So it's very popular for things that if you want to lighten the weight of it so you're not casting uh, something super solid or heavy and also or if you have internal components that you need to assemble inside the casting and you don't want to have multiple pieces that you weld or assemble together to get that cavity. And it's more economical likely from the machining aspect of it since the core is there it reduces the machining which obviously reduces the cost of the part yeah in some cases yes yeah, so you have your reusable permanent mold and then bringing in that sand aspect but blending both of the kind of mold types there so that's pretty interesting yeah well thank you rachel and stephanie that was a great overview of potential pros cons of each process kind of how they differ other than the obvious, one is sand, one is steel. So hopefully our listeners get a better idea of when to use one process over the other. Hopefully helped out there and really appreciate you both coming on the podcast. Thanks for having us, Mary. Thanks for listening to Casting Class, the engineer's podcast for all things metal casting. For more episodes, videos, and guides, check out BatesvilleProducts.com. See you next month.